So uh, the talk, this talk here, the point of this talk is going to be to talk about uh, some of the relevance of neuroscience concept to, uh, to robotics and computation. Um, just uh, to give you a heads up, initially, so the title of the talk was Bio-Inspired Control Architecture for Mobile Robotics. Uh, looking at my slides, I actually extended it a little bit and I renamed it Bio-Inspiration for Perception of Locomotion in Mobile Robotics. So essentially, what that means very simply is that before I was just going to talk to you about control stuff for robotics, and uh, now I've extended that a little bit. If I can find the thing now. And that's a little bit to do to talk about a little bit of perception as well. So we'll talk about how we can try to use neuroscience to make our lives easier in robotics uh, to solve control problems. And then at the same time, we'll talk about uh, how we use neural networks to address, to address some computational problems in robotics. And, and what we'll talk about is, you know, try to do a little bit of uh, maybe expectation management it's a very good tool that solves a lot of problems, but then sometimes when people talk about it, they get, they get a little bit carried away. And uh, so the point of the talk today is to talk about concepts, right? So uh, I want to talk to you guys about ideas and, and, and the notion of why we do things the way we do it. Uh, but at the same time, I'm gonna try to do that grounded in specific examples. So the examples in themselves don't really matter because that's just the nitty gritty of it, but I also want to go through that to give you guys sort of a taste for what it looks like in practice so that it's grounded in reality and in actual concrete control problems and robotics problem that we've worked on over the years. So uh, you were nice enough to introduce yourself. I'll give you just a couple of details on my background so that you know where uh, all this is coming from. Uh, I studied electrical and uh, ocean engineering, and I did my PhD in mechanical. Um, concretely, so electrical, I just did some, some electronics, and then ocean engineering and mechanical engineering, that was just robotics. So the research was on control theory, and the application was on robotics, and more specifically, mobile robotics. So in Dania Beach, I was working on marine vehicles, autonomous underwater vehicles, and autonomous surface crafts. And then in Virginia Tech, I worked on, on all sorts of, of mobile vehicles, unmanned mobile vehicles, including unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, I got my PhD in 2009, since then I worked in a couple of places. I worked in France uh, in a research institute uh, affiliated with DGA, that's the French Weapon Procurement Agency. There I worked on unmanned aerial vehicles. And then I spent a bit of time in, uh, in EPFL as a, uh, as a postdoc. And there I worked quite a bit, or some of the stuff we're going to see today is uh, stuff that I work on uh, while I was there. And one of the next speakers, Atoish Ravan, sits, sitting in the back, comes from the same place. So there might be some, some small overlap between what we talk about. Uh, after that, I worked at CEA on similar topics. I worked in industry as well at Tales Underwater Robotics, uh, Tales Underwater Systems, actually. And then for a couple of years now, I've been at TOM in Munich. Uh, where, so I come decidedly from, uh, you know, research-oriented focus, and now I've been moving slowly towards more applied research. So at UM, I'm working on, on robotics innovation. Cool, so two main topics I want to talk to you about. Uh, and again, the point is to, to try to understand how we can use stuff coming out of neuroscience to make our lives easier or to solve some difficult problems in, uh, in robotics. So the first one that I'll be talking about is about motion control and locomotion control. And, and on that side of things, uh, we're actually not using neural networks, we're simply using some concepts from neuroscience. And we're trying to replicate, uh, in some sense, the control architecture we see in human beings or in living beings to try to make our lives easier in solving some, some problems which otherwise are gonna be uh, would be very difficult. So we'll talk about that. We'll go over why we care about that kind of problem. So this is a swimming robot, but more generally we'll talk about, uh, I want to say agile locomotion or bio-inspired agile locomotion for mobile robotics. And then the second part of the talk is gonna be about uh, the use of neural networks to address computational problem in robotics. So when we do robotics, uh, we actually have to solve a lot of different kind of problems. We have some control problems, we have some perception problems, and then on top of that, uh, we also need to be able to do, this is not running very well, that's fine. We'll get it later. 
uh, yeah, we, we need, if we need to have a system that's going to be able to behave autonomously in its environment and solve non-trivial missions, we need that system to be able to do some decision making on its own. So that implies some level of, of intelligence. And uh, so we have some robotics people in the room. I would, I would argue very much that today, uh, robots are not that clever, not very intelligent. But that is something that if we want to move forward and address more challenging problems, it's something that we'll need to work on and, and maybe some, something that, uh, for which neuroscience could, uh, could help us. So just one more slide of background to clarify some, some topics. For some of you, that's clear. For some others, maybe not so much. Uh, we'll be talking about controls. I want to tell you in a couple of words what that means. So when we talk about control, we talk about control of a system. Uh, a system can be anything and everything. It's something that you're interested in and that you're studying. And essentially, a system is going to be uh, something you're interested in, something that is going to generate uh, an output. Uh, and that output is what, what you're specifically interested in. So uh, that system could, for example, be a mobile robot. Your output is going to be the mobility you provide to a sensor payload. Uh, it could be the car on the road. And so the, the output would be your trajectory on the road, or it could be you know, a sausage factory, and then the output is a sausage. And then the systems we study typically also have inputs. And uh, the point of this is that by playing with the input, you can affect the output. And the point of control is knowing what I want precisely the output to be. How do I design my, my input or control input to be able to guarantee that the output is going to behave the way I want it to behave? So in a nutshell, that's what control is. Um, we could say a lot more things, but that, that's essentially what, what I'll stick with. Uh, one thing, uh, just one, one comment I'll do in passing, most control is either explicitly or implicitly it's model-based. So when we're adjusting the control input, we need to have some understanding of how that's going to affect the output. Because if we don't know how we're going to influence the input, the output with the input, then we don't have any way to set it in a way that's smart. So, when, when we do design a control input, we rely on some form of model information in general. So that's for control. Uh, robots. What's a robot? Do you guys know what's a robot? Do you have a good definition for it? Because there are not many very good definitions around. I don't, I don't even know exactly how to define it precisely, but in general, a robot is a, a you know, mechatronical system, so electronics, mechanics, and software, and it's something that's going to have some actuation, so typically some motors, so there's going to be some movement. That movement is going to allow the robot to interact with the environment, and also at the same time, the robot is perceiving its environment to be able to act uh, in good intelligence with what's happening around it. And uh, I would say, or I would argue, one of the defining traits of what, what a robot is is the fact that you link those two things with some sort, again, of intelligence in there. So this is a very generic notion. There is in there some control, there's some perception, there's some cognition, whatever, but you link what you measure in the world uh, with the action on how you're going to act on the world. So you have a closed loop because you are closed through, through your environment. So that's what a robot is. Do you guys want, are, is that okay with you guys? Do you have questions or remarks or? That's okay, okay, fine. All right, so the first thing I'll talk about is uh, mobile robotics and, 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 and what, uh, what, what are the problems in there. Um, the pictures you see here we have, um, so we have what we would call, uh, if we were rigorous, I would say cluttered, unstructured environment, uh, less, less formally I would say those, those places are a complete mess. So the reason why I'm putting those up there is that if we were able to have mobile agents, intelligent mobile agents, that could go through in those places and robustly, safely, reliably move through those places, uh, then we would be able to, to solve a lot of very interesting problems. So the picture on the right, that's a collapsed building in Fukushima after the events that, that you know. Uh, the picture on the left, that's somebody's bedroom. I want to say that's not my bedroom because mine is much, much cleaner. Uh, and here we have a, a shallow pond. So the point is that in Fukushima, after the incident, um, so for obvious reasons, they could not send humans in there. And in general, you want to use robots for what we call the three Ds, uh, the types of problems that are either dull, dirty, or dangerous. So this is very much dangerous. 
Uh, it took time to send robots. A lot of robots got stuck in many different places. And, and overall, that did not work out so well. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. You guys have seen the uh, Boston Dynamics videos, right? A big dog walking around. You've seen like how it's like ice dancing on, on, on ice and so on. Uh, do you think that big dog could like navigate that kind of environment? So I don't know because that stuff is, you know, a lot of it is military and classified. I would strongly contend that no, probably not. So the point is between uh, video highlights that you shoot of after how many takes, I don't know, or something that looks really cool. And you can see with your eyes that it's doing something very clever and very good in terms of, you know, having some agility. Uh, that's one thing, it's already very impressive, but the point is that from there to being able to be in the field, far away from a human, from a human operator, and be able to reliably move through those things, not get stuck in rubble, not flip over, uh, there's a very, very, very big gap between those two things. And to be able to go from one to the next, uh, that's probably like years of work and a lot of, so this is what would be product qualification in industry, essentially. And I, I, I do not believe that Big Dog is there yet. So that's uh, search and rescue or like monitoring in, in, in you know, uh, dangerous, dangerous environments. There is value in there. And that's something that we don't really know how to do very well. Uh, the other option to go in there would be to have, uh, especially indoors, there would be quad rotors, flying drones. That works well, but the, the battery autonomy is not that good. So you, you have the problem that you cannot have a long running mission with that either. So that, we don't know how to do it very well. The point of including the one on the left, so the messy room, uh, you guys may be aware of that. We have an aging uh, problem situation in Europe and the world in general. So the point is that within 10, 20 years, we're not gonna have enough nursing homes to take care of the elderly, so me included. So that is, that is part of why it actually motivated Japan to work on, on uh, bipedal and, and, and social robotics, which is that we need to find ways to take care of the elderly. Uh, the point is that to be able to do that at home, you need to have your robot to be able to walk around and again in a reliable manner. If it gets stuck or cannot open the door or like trips on the carpet and falls on its face, uh, you know, the, the thing is useless. You need the thing to be robust. You need it to be able to move around even in messy rooms. And you, you need to be able to guarantee that that's going to happen. Uh, we're not there yet at all. Uh, either by bipedal robotics or even more general, you know, other form of robots. I can tell you from practice, from working in robotic innovation, I see that every day. We're not, we're not able to do that. I'm not going to spend too much, too much more time here. Uh, this is about pollution and being able to, to monitor. Uh, we have a lot of pollution coming from agriculture, for example. Being able to, to swim in, in shallow ponds, rivers, and lakes, that's, that's a fairly challenging problem. And the last one, you might recognize that's the Costa Concordia from four or five years ago uh, that capsized off of the coast of Italy. Um, there, in that kind of situation, so there were people stuck inside and people, people, people died because of that. Uh, that is difficult because the only way that we know how to save those people right now is to send divers in there. Uh, that's problematic because that's a very dangerous environment. It's a dangerous and dynamic environment. It changes with the weather. If the, if the weather is not right, if there's too much wind, the, the, the divers cannot go there. So you waste a lot of time to ensure and you put your divers in, uh, at risk as well. So ideally, you would like to have uh, intelligent robots able to like, navigate that environment as well. Uh, because you would save a lot of time and you would have been able to save a lot of people. Uh, we, we are not quite there yet. So all of that to say that if you're able to, to develop robots that are agile and clever enough to be able to navigate those environments, uh, you know, you're likely going to become very, very rich and you're going to be able to address a very important problems that have a very high uh, so, so, so social impact. And so, the, so I did not work on all of that. I worked a little bit on, on uh, the aspect that could concern those two, which is uh, swimming robots. And that's work that I did uh, when I was at EPFL in Oke Ishpas group that happens to be Shravan's boss as well. Um, so besides agility, there are other points why we care about, about swimming robotics. Most of the threats in the world uh, is carried by sea. 
um, you guys have been on boats, right? Have you ever like watched the way, watch the wake of a boat, like the, the water behind the boat? What does it look like? It's a big mess with water churning and blah, 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 right? So what that tells you with your eyes is that you have a lot of energy loss that goes in the water. And what I can tell you is that propellers, which is what everybody uses to, uh, to move in the water, they're not very efficient at all. So to, to, to track down the numbers is kind of difficult because propeller designers have a vested interest in telling you that it is you know, very efficient. Uh, from what I can understand, the uh, mechanical efficiency of propellers is in the range between 40 and 50 percent. So for the energy, the mechanical energy you inject in your propeller, you get back less than half of that in forward movement, which is not great. Uh, with swimming locomotion, so fish are able to do it very well. We're still very clumsy and still working on that kind of stuff. But still, in, in lab, in a controlled environment, we're able to show up to 60, 65% efficiency. So there are many problems there, and I'm not going to take any, any shortcuts, and I'll be very clear about that. There are problems in scaling up what you see in the lab in a small setup up to a giant tanker, for example. Uh, but still, even if you were able to, to raise efficiency by 5 or 10%, uh, you know, that's a lot of money. Uh, that's a lot of pollution avoided, and that, that, would be, that would be something very interesting. So this is the motivation. Uh, that's, why, that's why it's interesting to work on, on swimming robots. Now, the point is that, as I was just telling you, we're not quite there yet. I was just telling you we're not able to go here, and we're not able to scale it up. So what are the problems? And, and, and God knows that we have problems there. So the first problem is that, the way that you generate movement is complicated. It's not direct. If you think at how you create movement, for example, in a car, if you just think about the movement, longitudinal movement going forward, you have the wheel, you apply torque on the wheel, and then you roll, and then that makes you go forward, right? So you have one actuated degree of freedom, like the torque you apply on the wheel, and you have like one movement degree of freedom. You have a one-to-one -one relationship. Here, it's a complete mess. It's completely different. That guy is only moving in one degree of freedom as well. It's only going forward. Uh, we don't have one motor. We have seven different motors. So I don't have... So that thing is composed of uh, eight segments, eight rigid segments connected by elect small electric motors. We have a flexible caudal fin at the end. And I cannot take like one of those motors, and make it move, and, and get movement. I need to coordinate all of them to make something happen and indirectly generate some thrust. So there's an extra step that there that makes things more complicated. That's the first thing. The second thing, uh, as I hinted at earlier, is that when we do control, to be able to control a system, we need to understand how it works. We need to have some information on how it works. And that's captured using a model. Uh, coming up with a model describing the behavior of that thing here is a complete nightmare for many reasons. From high school physics, you, you, you probably saw uh, rigid body dynamics, right? So rigid body dynamics is about one rigid thing moving in space. Here you have eight of them, and uh, not just eight of them, but eight of them connected together. So you have what, what we call a multi-body system. On top of that, you also have a not rigid but flexible caudal fin. So that makes things even more complicated. I could go on for a very long time. Another thing here is hydrodynamics. Even hydrodynamics for one single rigid body, we don't, we don't know how to do that very well. There are things we don't really understand. And on top of that, to be able to have nice, useful, clean model, uh, it's very difficult because it depends on, on, on many different factors. It depends on the surface condition of your body. It depends on the, uh, the shape, specific, specific shape. It depends on water composition. It depends on many things. So to model that stuff, that, that, that's absolutely horrible. Or a very exciting challenge, depending, depending who you ask. But, but either way, it's, it's, it's difficult. But more generally, um, the reason why this is, this is difficult is because we don't understand how swimming works. We don't understand how it works on a fundamental level. Uh, you guys may or may not be aware of what, what is called the, uh, the uh, gray paradox. So um, 
there was a biologist, his name was Gratink, he was in the 30s, anyways, it was a long time ago, and he was looking at hydrodynamics, he was looking at dolphins moving through water. And what he did is, he looked at the speed they were going, thought that was fairly impressive, which it is, and tried to compute the drag, or like how much force the dolphin would need to produce to be able to move at the speed that it does. And you compute that using hydrodynamics. And the guy was like the best at that, so he, was, he really, really knew what he was doing. What he came up with was very confusing to him because the effort, according to his calculations, and that guy is so famous, we still know of him like 80 years later, according to his calculations, uh, the effort that the dolphin would need to generate to move at the speed it's going is about a factor of five greater than what it's able to produce with, uh, with the muscle it has on itself. So we don't really know why that is. So the, uh, the intuition that people have is because the guy was looking at movement of a rigid body in water, and we don't understand how the uh, moving bits in the water change the hydrodynamics of it. That's the intuition, but people still don't really know exactly how it works. So this is still poorly understood. We know how to, how to fake it, we know how to mimic it, we know how to like, reproduce it in some sense, but it's something that's complicated and something that's, that's still a bit beyond us. So now we know why, uh, why this is interesting. We know why it's a pain, uh, pain in the neck. So now the question is, is what do we do to try to make it work, right? And so the first, uh, the first thing we did as any self-respecting nerd, and I mean by that I mean engineers, is we, we looked at it very carefully and we tried to model the crap out of it. So we looked in great detail. The good thing is that we have an experimental setup uh, where we can take as much data as we want. We have see the, the LEDs, we can track them and we can capture the movements and we can use that to study it. We were also working with people that are very good at that kind of things. And we spent uh, quite a bit of effort. So that, the work shown here, I'll, I'll move forward a little bit faster because I'm taking too much time. But what you're seeing here, that in gray, that's uh, experimental data that, that we capture at EPFL. In blue, that the, uh, the output of a model, like really, really sharp cutting edge model, back then it was two years ago. Uh, from our friends and colleagues, Frédéric Boyer, called him in Nantes, and, uh, and Mathieu Porez as well, called him in Nantes. So the point is that, with, and those guys, those guys are very, very, very good at what they're doing. So with very good people and very good data, uh, we're able to capture a model that sort of, you know, qualitatively, so what you're seeing from left to right is a different pose of the body as it's moving forward. Uh, so this is like one uh, of the swimming gates, that's one cycle. Uh, so qualitatively, we're able to have something that looks like it, but quantitatively, uh, we are far cry from being there because you can see on just like one swimming cycle, uh, for example, here we've lost 20 centimeters already of like forward traveling. So, you know, that goes to show again, we don't truly really understand uh, what makes it tick and, and how it works. So. You know, we don't truly really understand the, the model of it, but what we know is that the fish are able to do it and we can look at what they're doing and we can try to like reproduce that and see, see if we can get something out of that. Um, and the first step to do that and the first apparent uh, you know, feature of what they're doing is a swimming gait, what it looks like in the water. And essentially, the way that we think that, that swimming works is that, or the way that we know it works, what we know of it, uh, that, is, that is fairly sure that you get some exchange of efforts between the body uh, and the surrounding fluid, and that is done through change of shape of the, of, the, of the swimmer. There are different ways to approach that. I have some colleagues, for example, from CNRS that try to compute what is the change of form that is appropriate to generate the thrust. It's a complete nightmare, and they're struggling mightily. The flip side is to just replicate what we see in terms of change of shapes uh, in biology, throw that in the water, and see what the hell happens, right? And that, that's what we've been doing, or that's what, what Oker has been doing. Uh, and one way to do that, or so what you need to be able to do that, is to uh, create those change, changes of shape uh, along, along the body of the robot, and so another way of saying that is that you want to coordinate actuation of the different degrees of freedom. So to be completely clear, you can do that uh, in many, many, many different ways. 
uh, the way that Oku has been doing it is by using uh, central pattern generators or by using a, a model of central pattern generators. So the CPGs, those are, so I'm not a neuroscientist, so if I say silly things like, guys, feel free to like correct me, but my understanding is that CPGs is a neural circuitry you have in your spinal cord that uh, is used to uh, control rhythmic motion, or rhythmic, rhythmic activation of muscles in the body, like when your heart is beating, when you're breathing, but also, for example, when you're walking, uh, you don't need to think about which muscles you, you, you activate to walk. You just walk normally. Uh, and so that, that repeat, repeated activation, that, that's taken care of by the CPGs in your spinal cord. Uh, and there's some studies more or less, um, you know, tasteful or distasteful. For example, if you cut a cat's head and put it on a treadmill, it's able to, to walk and run very well. And that suggests that so the intelligence in terms of co coordinating movement, that's not in the head, that would be somewhere else, and that would be in the spinal cord. So what Oka did is it looked at those, those circuits and tried to extract how they were functioning. And he represented that using what he calls a set of couple nonlinear differential equations. Now the reality is that if, if you guys uh, you know, understand what there, this is, this is trivial, there's nothing in there. Uh, there's just some uh, sinus, sinusoidal coupling between the different degrees of freedom. Uh, we have a low pass filter and that's about as basic as it gets. But what's interesting here is that we're using that coordination thing to, to try to get some traction on this problem and to try to simplify our work because we have all those degrees of freedom that are supposed to work together. We just emulate what we see in biology, apply that, and then see what that takes us. And that's the first step. But that's only a first step because when you have that actuation or when you have that coordination of actuation, what you do is what you were saying in that video earlier. What you're doing is that you're producing movement. And then in that CPG, you have a lot of different parameters. You can tweak and play with them to change how the change of shape is going to look like. You can change the amplitude, the distribution of amplitude along the body. You can change frequency, number of traveling waves along the body, and so on. And the trick from there, because being able to move is not enough. You want to be able to, to steer in which direction you move. You want to do locomotion. And then on top of that, you want to do motion control. So the way that we do that is by taking that CPG and essentially lumping that with the system. So now our, our entire system that we're going to be controlling, it's not just a robot that's in the water. That's a robot that's moving in the water. So that's a locomoting system. And then we're going to add a layer of control on top of that. And we're going to, depending on what we measure and what we should be doing, we're going to adjust the CPG parameters in real time. So what were parameters now become control variables. And we're going to use that to control movement, uh, movement of the robot. So the point here, and I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff because there are more things that I want to spend more time on. The point here is that this can be a very difficult problem or even near impossible problem to solve. Again, I have colleagues working on trying to understand how I change so the deformation of the body to generate the stress that I need to like go in the direction, blah, blah, blah. That is very interesting, but, but you know, it's, it's not, uh, I want to say, mathematically tractable. Uh, instead, when you split the problem between locomotion, where you assign the coordination through those CPGs, and then you come and act upon that, you find yourself with a problem that is still kind of challenging, and we still had uh, a little bit of, of work to do. You might have seen a couple of equations in the, in the slide that, that went through. But that became a lot more manageable, and uh, that became some things that we were able to solve uh, very, very well. And essentially, what you're seeing on the left so this is a tiny model of the longer version that you saw earlier. We made it small because it's actually harder when there's fewer, fewer segments. So that was like the more interesting or more challenging problem. And what you're saying or what we're tracking is, and of course you don't see it very well on slides, but the desire or like the thing we're tracking is the direction of motion. So we have a desired direction of motion, which is in green. And then we get that the average actual direction of motion tracks it. So we want the blue dash to like follow the green. And it's actually working fairly well. You have uh, the variables on the right. And, and it's, you know, for what it is, this is about as good as it gets for control movement of, of swimming robots. So that was simulation. We have some experimental results as well. 
but uh, so I go, I go to the punchline here. Um, so what we did is we used a control architecture that is similar to what we have in, uh, in vertebrates. So we have the coordination of movement, which is coming from the CPG, so from the spinal cord, and then the control work which we did to come and adjust uh, the parameters to guide movement, that's similar to stuff that the brain does. And so we're generating those descending signals that come attack the CPGs, and those would be our control inputs. So a couple of things I want to say here, first of all, is that what we did in swimming robots, that's something that you can generalize to legged robots. Uh, and, and those guys here would be the robots that you would need to address the other problems we were talking about earlier. So again, you, you can do that here, but there's still like a lot of things that need to be done. And um, what I want to say is that in our case, it was actually fairly easy. We have, so we're essentially moving in, in three degrees of, of freedom. We're like stuck at the surface because we're floating and we're in suspension in water. So that's fairly comfortable and easy. Uh, when you start walking on ground, so when you're quadruped, you can still be statically stable. So meaning you have like four points and you can leave it there and very often it's gonna be, you don't need to touch it, it's not gonna fall on its, on its butt. But when you have uh, so this is not an actual bipedal worker, it's an exoskeleton, but just humor me here. When you look at, at, at bipedal workers, uh, it becomes more difficult because you need to, uh, you need to like not fall forward. You need to have some sort of balance and equilibrium, and that's non-trivial, especially if you're not working on, on flat ground, clean surfaces. So there are, there are more things to do. Um, there are other ways besides CPGs to coordinate uh, actuation of, of actuated degrees of freedom, uh, but you know, it's, it's as good a way as, as, as many others. So that was, that was the first part of the talk. Um, one, one last comment I will make, and that's something I, I touch upon again a little bit later, is that uh, in general, I, I firmly believe there's no such thing as, as difficult problems. Um, the point is that a problem, if it seems difficult, to me that means that you are not looking at it from the right perspective. So a lot of the stuff we do in engineering to solve problem, it's about finding the right perspective to, to, to solve it. And there are many, many examples of, of problems that initially become like seem completely impossible, but eventually once you figure it out like how that works, uh, it's not just easy, it becomes, it becomes borderline trivial. Uh, so the second part of the talk, and this will have to be extremely short, uh, or maybe we can talk about it some more later, is about how to use neural computation or like the different ways that we can use neural computation to solve problems for, for robotics. And we've already been through like those different, uh, different, different, we have the same uh, block diagram that we had earlier. Um, when we do robotics, we have those different, I want to say, building blocks that we need to plug together for that thing to do something that's useful and intelligent. And it so happens that for several of those computational tasks, we can actually use neural networks as a tool to, uh, to solve that. Uh, we've been doing it for many years uh, on control aspects. Uh, so sometimes the entire control task is addressed using neural networks. Sometimes it's only part of the control task. Uh, we've been doing more and more for uh, perception, and by perception, what I mean here is taking raw data from sensors and transforming that into useful information that you can act upon to, to inform either movement or the manner in which you want to pursue the mission for, for your robot. So what, what I want to say and, 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 and what, what I'd like to, to explain, I don't know if I have the time to get there, is that neural networks are very, very good tools for the things, but Sometimes you come across people that will try to explain to you that it's a magic bullet that can solve any and all problem and that you can draw through a neural network at a problem, snap your finger, have it learn something, and then have it like repeat that robustly. Most of the time that's either wrong, flat out wrong, or it's, it's not able to do that robustly. Uh, and it's something that uh, people in general are not, not, not very careful of for, for, for many different reasons. So what we'll be looking at here is a, a perception problem which we did solve using neural networks. And this picture here sort of uh, gives you 
part of the motivation or part of the reason why uh, we were working on that problem. So this is some random AUVs that I found in, in Wikipedia Commons. The, the point of this picture is to show you this is the nominal operating conditions for AUVs uh, today. So this is what, what, like this is where they know how to be, this is the kind of place that they know how to handle. And so what do you see in there? You see nothing, right? So that's what they're good at, being around absolutely nothing. And the reason for that is that uh, to position themselves, to, to, to perceive their environment, they're using acoustic methods, they're using sonars. And when you are close to uh, rigid boundaries, when you're close to the bottom, actually, actually, when you're close to the surface, so I'm actually, this is not that great of a picture, uh, the waves, the acoustic waves bounce, and the closer you are to something, the harder it becomes to see it. So when you're in the middle of nowhere, you're able to see all the small things around you. If you're close to hard structures, if you're close to, to walls, if you're, you know, God forbid, if you're in a tunnel, then you can forget about it because you have your acoustic waves bouncing left and right. You have what you call in acoustics a uh, multipath problem, and you don't know your left from your, from your right. You have no way, no way to know where you are or how close you are to a wall. And that's a problem. That's a problem because more and more we're trying to go towards renewable energies. And one of the solutions, for example, in France that they go after is uh, offshore renewable energy, so either water turbines or, or wind turbines. And that's, you know, cool and interesting, but the problem is that the ocean is a very aggressive environment. Uh, you have a lot of stresses on the structures that are at sea. You have mechanical stress from currents, like if you're near, near the bottom and you have sand, you have, uh, you have erosion on your structure, and then you also have chemical stress because if you have metallic parts and if they're exposed, uh, then they're gonna rot away in a couple of weeks and then you can forget, forget about your structure. So there are a lot of investments that are being made right now into setting up offshore renewable energy parks. Uh, that comes with correspondingly high efforts in terms of monitoring and maintenance because you want to keep eyes on those things to be able to detect problems early because if you don't, then you will need to come a few weeks later to replace half of those things. The problem is that when you try to come next to that thing here, uh, you cannot use you cannot use sonars. Uh, when you're close to it, you're not going to be able to use sonar to, to to see where it is or where you are compared to it. So the way that people have been have been uh, addressing the task of monitoring and maintenance of those uh, of those structures is by using remotely operated vehicles. So instead of having something autonomous that just goes and does its own thing, you have a, uh, a remotely controlled submarine. So you have an operator that's in, on the boat and looking actually through cameras at what's happening. So you have somebody that needs to be there and needs to, to pilot that. Uh, first of all, that's a problem because you're gonna have like bigger and bigger parks to look after and you cannot, it's hard to scale. I mean, that scales the job and that scales, that, that, that means that it's gonna cost more and more money. So that's, uh, that becomes a problem in terms of whether you're able to afford the energy that you're, that you're creating. But on top of that, even with that solution, uh, even if that was viable economically, uh, in many conditions, it's difficult for the operator to do his job because you have, even if you bring light, even if you illuminate, if you have a little bit of current and if the water is not, is not clear, you don't really see what happens. On top of that, there are a lot of phenomena, like when you put a lot of light in water, you have what they call flattening. You cannot tell the depth very well because, because of the illumination. So uh, in practice, even with an operator in the loop, uh, they have a lot of problems uh, because it doesn't see where it is, it doesn't have environmental awareness, it doesn't see when, when it hits the structure, so they have a lot of, of systems breaking and that, that costs them a lot of money. So all of that to say that there is a strong need for uh, ways to be able to perceive stuff that's like close to you. We can perceive stuff that's far, but perceiving stuff that's close to you, we don't know how to do it well uh, in the field and uh, that's something for which there is, there is a strong industrial demand. And uh, it's 10 o'clock now, so I'll just say, I'll just wrap up in a couple of words, and then if we have time, we can talk more later. 
so the point is we've worked on, on using electric fields to be able to feel what is close to you. And that actually works really well, uh, like on a fundamental level, physical level, you're able to do, to do interesting stuff. The trick is that it's very difficult from your electric measures to reconstruct what's happening around you. There are models to do that, but they're very complicated and they're very hard to work with. So what we did is we used neural networks to solve that problem. And by applying it very carefully, uh, we were able to solve a problem that is very difficult and that, that, that worked out very well. And now that's something that we're moving towards, uh, towards industrial applications. So thank you for your attention and then maybe we'll get, we'll get an opportunity to chat, uh, to chat later. So we'll, let's, let's start again. So the first part was about controls, it's gonna be about perception. And uh, what, I was, what I was trying to explain is that there is a need for technology for like proximity perception on the water. And again, if you manage to do that and manage to do it well, you're gonna become a rich man because there's gonna be, uh, there is right now a pressing need for that kind of stuff for monitoring and maintenance of offshore structures. Uh, there's gonna, that need is gonna grow exponentially in the coming years. So one of the ways that you can go about it is through manipulation of electric fields. So that work is stuff that I did or that, that has been done uh, or that has been worked on by a number of different research groups uh, in Europe and US. Uh, that started actually in the middle of last century in the 50s. Biologists realized that there existed a number of uh, fish species that were able to manipulate electric fields to uh, get some information on their surroundings. The way they do it is they simply polarize different parts of the body, like plus, minus, and that is gonna inject some electricity around them. And then depending on what's around them, uh, let's say prey or like the bottom of the water, uh, that those things in the environment are gonna deform the electric field. And they have a lot of tiny electrodes, essentially like along the body, they're able to measure even like very small perturbations. And they are smart enough to from there infer what is around them. And they're able to, uh, for example, navigate in cluttered environments in very shallow water and around rocks without any light whatsoever. And they're also able to, to use that to hunt prey and to, to, to feed on that. So the notion to try to sort of like replicate and emulate that for robotic applications emerged around the early 2000s. First uh, in the group of uh, Michael McIver, uh, who's now I think he's in Northwestern, and then also uh, in the group of my colleague Frédéric Boyer in, uh, in Nantes. Um, and in terms of like what this is good for and bad for, uh, or in terms of like what, what you can do with it, it's something that's interesting because you can use it for a number of different applications for robotics. Uh, you can use that for communication from, uh, fishes actually use that to communicate with each other, by the way. You can use that for communication underwater. Uh, you can use that to detect the presence of obstacle and navigate cluttered environment. And you can also use that to estimate relative positions of different robots trying to work together underwater. So for coordination of movement of underwater systems. In terms of limitations, uh, what I was, this, this had the advantages of its disadvantages, if you will. So this is a, a short range uh, perception, uh, perception modality. So essentially, we say that the uh, detection range around the, uh, the fish or the robot it's a bubble that's uh, roughly the radius of the, uh, the size of the dipole here. So you have, around that guy, for example, you have a perception bubble that's roughly that range. And that's very short, and there's a lot of concerns with that, but for what we're interested in, what we want to do, that's perfect, because we have acoustic methods to see far. What we need is to be able to see the stuff that's like right next to us. And again, so we worked on that uh, for a number of different applications. So another thing I want to mention is that one of the trick with that is that this is an active sense. Uh, so to, for it to work, you need to apply, you need to, uh, to, to apply some energy to your environment. You need to apply that electric field. So that implies that to be able to make it work, you're actually like consuming a little bit of energy. Uh, and you can think of that, uh, you know, thing here, this is like illuminating the scene when you're doing, when you're doing vision. You apply some light and then you're able, you're able to see what's around you. 
So when we tried to go about uh, emulating that or reproducing that for robots, uh, so you might recognize this is the same robot that I was showing to you earlier, the swimming robot. Uh, the way we went about it is simply, we took a robot modules and put a, a number of electrodes on them. And we did just like the fish, we use those electrodes to apply an electric field to the environment, so you see the same dipole here. And then at the same time, we use those electrodes uh, to measure currents that flows uh, through them. Um, and the way we try to exploit that or the general intuition is that depending on the, the scene configuration, so we have those two guys here, we have an emitter and a re receiver, depending on how they are located with respect to each other in their environment, then the electric field that this guy is going to see, that's going to change depending on that, right? So what I just said, uh, what you could repeat in a, in a more formal manner is that depending on, on the scene configuration, you're going to have like different, different electric measures. So the question is, can we then invert that relationship? Can we, based on the measures we take, go back uh, and infer some relevant information regarding the environment? And that would be the perception task. And the answer to that question is yes, but there's a number of caveats. And the main problem that we have is that this relationship between scene composition here and measures, uh, measures done on the robot, that relationship is non-trivial. Uh, the models are there and they work really well for very simple scenes, but when you have something of arbitrary geometry, when you have uh, you know, like a deforming body and so on, then it becomes, it becomes very tricky. So, those models actually get so bad that it's difficult uh, to, to, to use them in practice because they're not, I would say, the borderline com not computationally tractable. So instead, what we try to do is we try to uh, capture a, a, a simpler, more manageable representation of that relationship. And we did that so using neural networks. Uh, and the reason why that works is that um, Essentially, we can capture a lot of data. We can capture enough data to describe any sort of range of, of configuration of those two swimmers together. And so we were able to have something that's representative of, of any situations encountered. Uh, one of the catches, though, is that we have, we have fairly, fairly, big, uh, fairly big, big network structures. So the way we went about it, we, we we use the configuration of a simple swimmer with one, two, three, four electrodes. So this is a, the, uh, your plus and your minus. Uh, we, used, we used that to apply the electric field to the environment. And then uh, we took a lot of measures. We did that both in simulation and, uh, and, and in practice. And we reconstructed a neural approximation of, uh, of the actual relationship between scene composition and measure. And uh, you can see here that, uh, so we, what we do essentially, so the scene composition depends on a number of variables. Here you have the measures uh, in Y as a function as uh, changing variables defining, defining the environment. So for example, this is a relative bearing of like where one robot is compared to the other. So what you can see is that essentially, uh, so this is your, your, your model, so this is the, the measures as a function of the, of the variables that describe the environment. And the neural network is actually able to like reproduce or to approximate the actual experimental data uh, fairly well. And then I will cut the, the fastidious details. The bottom line is that once you have the forward map from scene composition to, uh, to the measures, inverting it, you can do that using just very simple computational tricks, and that's not, that's not necessarily the interesting bit here. Uh, so I was not supposed to work on that, actually. It was some of our colleagues in France. I was still at EPFL, and I was talking with them, and they were working on the, on the perception problem for other stuff. So I was working on relative positioning. They were actually working on uh, detection of obstacles, and I had conversations with them because they were supposed to give us the algorithms to estimate relative position between those two guys. And the conversation went a weird way. They started out saying that it was trivial. And then they said, well, you know what? We've tried and maybe it's difficult. And then two weeks later, that turned into, uh, you know what? It's impossible, forget it. This is never going to work. And the reason why they were saying that is because they were doing the, uh, I want to say, like French engineer way, which is to overanalyze, overmodel everything and trying to have a like, firm grip 
on everything that's happening. So they were trying to just model like the entire scene with, with great detail. Uh, and again, for simple configurations, when you have just uh, emitter and receiver and you have just a wall, that's fine. But in general, when you have deforming bodies in the water, so see, those are the, uh, the field lines as we have the two swimmers uh, swimming next to one another. When you have stuff deforming like that, this is, this, is, this is extremely difficult to model. So this is actually, this is actually, so I'm telling you it's difficult to model. This is from a model. This is a numerical simulation. That's not experimental data. But what, what this is showing is that, first of all, this is a mess. And what I can tell you is that in practice, uh, it's, even, it's even more of a mess. So by trying to, to be accurate and model faithfully what was happening, they came to the conclusion that, you know what, we can't do it, you need to deal with it, and you know, just forget about it. So we turned that around and we said, you know what, we'll try to get the data and we'll try to identify it to see if we can make sense out of it. And we're able to do that with, with neural networks. And the bottom line is that if you're careful about what you're doing, you can use neural networks to solve problems that are, that, can, you know, that are very difficult. Like the guy told me it was impossible to solve and it took us like a, a month, a month and a half to do, to do the impossible. So that's, that, was, that, was, that was fun. Going back to the motivation we had, I was telling you that we need the technology to be able to, uh, be able to move around uh, rigid structure underwater. So now I'm gonna go to, to the other problem which is about uh, detection of proximity underwater. And that's something that's interesting for, for many things. Uh, and by the way, what we're doing here uh, underwater, you can also, that also works in the air, and that's something that is of particular importance in robotics and something that's fairly uh, topical right now because we're moving more and more towards uh, actively collaborating robots with humans. But to be able to do that and to be able to, to have that on the, on the factory, on the shop floor, you need the robot to know exactly where the human is. And right now what we're using typically to do that is cameras, and with cameras that doesn't really work really well because you need either some markers on the guy and they don't always wear the vest and then people die, or you can have some occlusion or you know, the lens is dirty, so you ne you, you're never able to actually guarantee that with a camera you know exactly where the human is in the scene. Especially because the camera is on the outside and you're gonna have the human like next to the robot and you don't necessarily see what's happening between the human and the robot. So here with electric sensing, having the sense directly on the robot, we would be able to detect exactly the presence of the human next to the robot and we could have something that's, that's safer. And it's something that actually uh, Comao in Italy has started using, although they're not, doing, they're not doing really localization of the human, they're doing just like touch contact and they stop, they stop the robot when it, uh, when it gets in touch with the human. So, but going back to underwater applications, as I was telling you earlier, uh, industrials are interested in monitoring but also maintenance of, uh, of, of offshore structures. And one of the things that we were working on when I was at CEA is to equip a, an underwater robotic arm with the electric sense in such a way that we're able to do a number of different things. So the point is that here, if we use it, and that diagram is not complete, it's missing a number of things, but the point is that you can regulate the position of your robotic arm and the effector to, to, to specific positions uh, next to the structure that you, want, that you want to work on. And essentially what we did there is we replicated what we had done with the relative positioning, but now we did that not for uh, two, two robots underwater, but for like just one robot or one here. It's an abstraction of a robot. This is actually an electric probe. And, and specific obstacles. And what happens is what I was talking about earlier, which is that when you have the obstacle that is in the water next to you, and if its electric properties are different from that of the surrounding fluid, then the presence of that, that object is gonna change and curve the, uh, the electric field, and that's something that you can actually detect based on the measures of the probe that's in the water, or like your, your, your sensor system. And then we did what we did for the uh, relative positioning, which is that based on those perturbations that we measure, we inverted the relationship to go back to scene composition, and then we estimated like where, where the obstacle was. And this is, so that work was done in a FED project, so Future and Emerging Technologies, uh, funded by the European Commission, 
Uh, the project was called Angels, and here you have a CAD view of, of one of the robots that we are working on. And you can see like the different electrodes on the surface here that we are using. So again, I'll skip the technical details. Uh, I'll show you some of the stuff that we are able to show or that we are able to achieve. So what you have here, and so what, what we had was fairly robust in the sense that we were able to make it work uh, in different sort of simulation because we had like closed form simulation, numerical simulation. So here this is a uh, finite element simulation. And also with experimental data, it was fairly repeatable from uh, actually from simulation to experimental stuff. Uh, and what we're able to do is so detect, for example, the presence before on the previous slide, we had small obstacles here. We're looking at uh, plain walls. Are you seeing two probes here because this is a mirror image of this one? So this is a real one, if you will. Uh, and what we're doing there is we're simply coupling. So we don't have any, any other senses besides the electric sense. And what we're doing is we're coupling the perception of the wall, which we're able to detect, with the movement of the robot to regulate position at a given desired distance from the wall. And uh, that's something that we are working on uh, on a request by some industrial partners, in particular from uh, uh, like naval, naval working sites, or like the Chantier Naval in Saint-Nazaire. They have uh, a lot of work for, uh, they're working on, on, on cleaning up boats from biofouling. When you have a boat in the water, it gets a lot of crap like on the side, on the hull, like, like uh, shells and so on, or seaweed. And then that actually creates more drag, so you lose a lot of money in terms of, uh, of fuel. So you need actually very regularly to put your, your, your boat in a dry environment to just be able to scrub it and clean it up. So what they wanted to do was to develop robots that could uh, go in the water and, and go along the surface of the of the along the surface of the hull, and then do do that work. But for that, again, you cannot use acoustics. You need to have a proximity sensor. So this is what we're showing here. This is a robot going next to next to the hull, and here we have something else. There we're working in a corridor actually. So we have one firm wall here. So we're showing that we're like regulating position at specific position with respect to the wall. And we have uh, a second wall at the bottom. So that would absolutely never work with acoustic, uh, acoustic positioning because you would have a uh, reflection of the acoustic waves from a wall to the next and you would be completely lost. Uh, final thing I'll show and then I'll go to the conclusion slide is uh, we, we replicated in the lab something that sort of looks like the, uh, the support structure for, uh, for wind turbines. We did like a much smaller version of it. This is made with plastic. And so I'm controlling actually here like the position of the, of the probe, but this is a feedback, uh, false feedback joystick and anyways, it's actually able to detect the presence of the wall and it's able to move around without me doing much about it. Let me play it again. So the point is that I'm, I'm setting it on a collision course with that fake wall there. It's seeing it, it's backing up, and eventually it's gonna on its own like turn around and come around the corner. And it's even, So you see it is moving around, it's gonna get stuck here, it's gonna actually like back, uh, back up because it knows, it knows it's stuck. So, and this is completely dumb, there's no intelligence in there. We're just coupling the electric perception with, uh, with the movement in a very simple way. So again, in conclusion, uh, well, w one of the things I want to say that in robotics, uh, we still have a lot of open problems. Uh, being able to, to move in difficult environments, that's something that I would argue we're still not very good at. Or like we're good at in, in highlight videos, we're certainly not good at it uh, in a repeatable manner in the field. That's not something we do very well. Uh, perception of the environment also, that's something that with specific data sets, we're able to show on specific things that we do very well, but more generally, robustly. I mean, you could put a robot in this room uh, it would have a hard time figuring out a, 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 you know, an empty chair from a person or exactly what is going on. 
uh, we don't have the robustness of perception to be able to, to really understand what's happening in a room, for example. And the last thing, and I think maybe the greater frontier for robotics uh, going forward, and that's something that's holding us back uh, tremendously, is, I want to say, like, intelligence, decision-making. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about that. Uh, I remember being in a conference, so I don't remember the guy's name, of course, because that would be, that would be too easy, but uh, I was in a conference, and uh, there was a guy that did the mission planner for the Mars rover robot. Uh, you guys know the robot I'm talking about, right? They sent a robot to Mars, and he was moving around and doing, you know, collecting samples and so on. And you would, and so this is, you know, like, back then that was still five, six years ago, so it's a little bit of time ago, but back then that was absolutely state, absolute state of the art. It was the best thing that was around. And the mission planning that they had was absolutely the dumbest stuff that you can think of. There was no decision, no decision making whatsoever. All it did, all it did, uh, or all it was, was a classifier between, like, many, 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 many different situations. So, the, the art of it was for the people doing the mission planning to try to foresee as many situations as possible and then to figure out what is the con contingency plan, like what we do in that situation. But the Mars rover had no actual intelligence. It had no, no, no capacity to improvise, to, to understand or to abstract anything. And that's the state of the art of decision making, more or less. Whatever that the mission planner, the guy that is the mission planning can anticipate, if you have the hardware to handle it, you're going to be able to handle it. If anything unexpected happens, then, you know, you can get lucky and be able to cope with it because, you know, it was not critical. But if something bad happens, you don't know, you typically don't know how to deal with that. And so that is preventing us from uh, achieving, you know, true decisional autonomy, which is key to, to many, many applications. Uh, and that's something that once we make progress on that, that's something that's going to open a lot of doors for, for, for robotics. And I would contend that right now we do a little bit of stuff in new science in robotics. So I showed you, you know, a small control architecture thing that we are doing that helped us for control. We're using some neural networks that are vaguely inspired from, uh, from neuroscience, from biological neural networks. This is still like very, very shallow. We're barely dipping our toes in there. Uh, there is very probably like many more things we could be doing. And what I'm trying to say is that there is room for improvement in most of the aspects of, of, of robotics, in most of the things that are relevant to robotics and most of the things that, that we're doing. So I think I'll, I'll conclude on that. We have like five, six minutes for questions. But the point is that we're barely touching neuroscience, but we have strong needs. So if there's a match there, it is something that is very much uh, worth pursuing and exploring. So uh, I want to thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to try to answer them. <laughs>